welcome um, to our CIPR Inside uh, event. Um, and today, as uh, you all know, is all about line manager communication. Um, for those that aren't aware, the uh, CIPR Inside is a committee of volunteers and have been working on this report uh, for the past um, two years. So uh, if it wasn't enough doing internal comms as the J job, uh, the uh, volunteers that have been supporting this research have given up their time to uh, interview, conduct analysis, and put this research together. So um, I just want to pass on my thanks to all of them that have been involved with that. Um, it's great to see it there and great for you to join us today. Um, I'm going to hand you over today to uh, Becky Paul and Chai Mystery, who were two of the volunteers uh, working on this report, um, to take us through some of the findings. Um, I know they've got a lovely session planned with a bit of discussion and a bit of insight. Um, so without any further ado, I'll hand over to the both of you. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, yeah. I Dan has just said, I mean, it's amazing to see a really good turnout today. Um, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. So I'm Chaya Mystery. I'm Vice Chair for CIPR Inside, and I'm Director of Humanly, which is a leadership development and communication consulting and coaching organization. And I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, and I'm really excited about this session because it's something that, as Dan said, we've been working on since 2020. We started, uh, early 2020, we started that research. And as you all know, that is the time when internal comms has been through um, through the wars, <laughs> it felt like. And so we really do appreciate um, all of the support that we've had to get this research done. And um, that kind of focus on people, I wanted to, you know, and Becky will introduce herself too, but I wanted to just really uh, give a shout out and a mention and a, and a big thank you to every person who also joined me um, uh, and there were six of us who worked on the research team. So there's um, Becky, who you see here and you'll hear, hear from in a moment, uh, Katie Marlowe, uh, Frida Grant, who's based out here in the Netherlands as well, Binu Jacob and Fiona Hassan. And everybody played a huge part. Um, and we really want to thank you all for that, um, that support and help. I'm going to hand you over to Becky, who's going to go through a bit more about the research. Hi everybody, so I'm Becky Paul. I'm on the committee for CIPR Inside and as Dan and I mentioned, on the team who did the research and, and wrote the report. A bit about me, I do some um, internal communications in Cambridge for a technology company called Arm. Um, and as I talk about what we're going to cover on this session, it would be really great if you're able to, some of you might be munching on, on lunch or some snacks, um, but if you could add to the chat box what you want to get out of the session together today, um, and we'll do our best to, to address those things as we go through um, the research findings um, and as we go through the session. So in the next sort of 40 minutes or so, we'll give some background information about the report, um, we'll share some of the key findings and some of our commentary um, to add to that. We'll answer some questions because it might be that some of you have already had time to look through the report and have come armed with some very specific questions about the research, in which case there's time for that. We're also going to give you the opportunity, so it's a choice, but the opportunity to split off into breakout groups for about 10 minutes. And that is really um, for those of you who want to talk through some kind of areas of interest or perhaps want to share ideas or ask people questions about how they're doing things. Um, your option at that point is to stay in this main room if actually what you'd like to get out of this is to ask some more questions about the report itself to, to Chaya and I. About 20 minutes before the end we'll bring everyone back into this room um, to care some key, share their key points from the, from the breakout session um, and at that point it would be really interesting for us to be hearing from you about your takeaways and perhaps some of your experiences about line manager communication. And we're aiming, hopefully everyone's aware, we're hoping to aim to finish at about 1.15 today, UK time. So some background about the report very briefly. It came about when a few of us came together to talk about the focus of CIPR Insight's next piece of research. And we ended up talking a lot about how line manager communication isn't talked about very much or in much depth among people in comms roles. There are exceptions to this clearly, but we did sense this kind of shared observation. Um, it's a tough nut to crack. So from what we'd observed ourselves, it isn't an area that is often prioritized by comms teams. And we felt it really should be. We wanted to do some research um, 
that would form the basis of a report that gave practical guidance um, to help us all to improve the standard of line manager communication in organisations and, and with our clients. So the aim was to share a digestible report and the point of it, the whole point of it is to prompt discussion. It's not a report full of answers, it's a report full of research and stats and a few suggestions and tips. Um, and the point was progress rather than perfection. So it was simple and little small scale to get the ball rolling. We based it on quantitative data from communicators to summarize the current thinking from a sample of people in comms roles. But it's also based, as those of you will know who've read the report, on some richer insights from interviews. And we wanted to not just survey communicators about this topic, but line managers themselves. Let's hear from them and also HR professionals, because, of course, HR often support line managers, too. So if you've read the report, you'll know our sample size was it was a little small. Um, some quick context on that. The survey and interviews happened this time last year when, of course, a lot of people, myself included, were feeling a bit burnt out after um, the events through the pandemic. And I think a lot of us felt like we were spread pretty thinly. So the research group agreed it wasn't terribly surprising that the response rate was, was fairly low. I think it was 70 responses from um, internal comms and kind of more around the 20 mark from, from line managers and HR. Um, and we did go down various promotional routes, but we just decided let's go ahead with what we've got. Let's get some information out there and get some discussion going. Talk very quickly, but there's the background. Um, we're now gonna get to the meat of this and share um, some of the key findings that are documented in the report. And we're gonna be sharing, Chai's gonna share a view of the report itself to get some of you familiar with, with what it looks like. Um, and Dan, are you able to share the link to the report in the chat for anybody who hasn't got the PDF up? Amazing. Over to you, Chaya. Cool. Thank you. I'll just check. Can everybody see the slide? Yes. Wonderful. Oh, we've done a lot of work on the slides. We've basically taken the report PDF. Um, so everything that I'm sharing on the slides, you can find in the report yourself. Um, so yeah, if we just have a look at, um, and I will just flip through the report so you can just see, you're gonna get a bit of a idea. So we wanted to go through these findings um, in a bit of a summary and, and a bit of conversation about it before we pop you into um, the rooms. And I'll start with the first one. Um, now, um, this might be something you already know, but one of the findings was kind of a validation. Um, and that is that senior leaders really do set the tone for good communication. Um, when leaders think and act in the ways that show that they see communication skills as a nice to have rather as not as a nice to have, but rather as a business enabler. That's the stuff that we see um, and that the participants said is the stuff that trickles down to line managers. Um, the topic of accountability did come up in um, in the research as well, and we actually found that there was very little accountability for line managers to be good communicators. Um, it's very clear that line managers need support and they need support from the top. Um, but the research also showed us and drew some attention to middle managers too, um, uh, from their support functions as well. So HR and communication pros. Um, so the accessibility of communication professionals and the connectedness of communication professionals with um, with HR professionals as well is something to, to uh, that came up as a topic. Um, what we found is that although a, a lot of um, a lot of people believe that communications is really important, um, the amount of attention that we're paying to it um, can be minimal, uh, and that's often it's down to just kind of workloads. And what one of the things that came out in the research is that our focus, when it is on some of the things that we can control. Um, they're the kind of channels that we rely on. So it kind of makes sense that we would be spending a lot of energy there. Um, but in the way that we'd want to improve our other channels, um, communication skills, training, coaching, those are the things that really um, line managers are asking for. Um, a few differences in, in whether they were optional um, trainings or whether they were mandatory trainings. Um, we found that actually one of the the triggers to that was the tone that's coming from the top and that's really the core of what this finding um, was. So I'm going to flip to the next finding and Becky will take us through that. 
Thanks, Jaya. So I saw in the chat, I think it was Sam um, made a point about how organisations are upskilling managers. So that's that's where this um, comes in. So we were really interested in finding out the extent to which line manager communication is currently being prioritised in companies and organisations and more about the level of collaboration, I suppose, and alignment between internal comms and HR teams when they support line managers. Um, so the research told us that comms people have high expectations. Um, we expect a high standard from line managers when it comes to their communication, but it's not reflected um, based on the survey results in what we prioritize and where we spend our time and our energy. And now that's not reason exactly to be hard on ourselves. Uh, it's very easy to say something's important and not as easy to change what we're working on to reflect that importance. But um, this finding is interesting, I think, in terms of what comms people say they want to, to be achieved. So respondents who were in HR roles and those in um, internal comms roles did agree that communications tasks for line managers should include things like reinforcing organisational values, listening to employees and forwarding updates. And I think um, some commentary on that, I think it is uh, interesting to me in terms of forwarding updates. Uh, that's an area where I personally think uh, line managers need help evolving from the role of, I suppose, cascaders to translators. Um, but on that point, the interviews of line managers highlighted they feel, um, or they can feel, some of them can feel very unsupported in how they share organisations' messages. So what they were flagging is, is when a message comes out, they're just asked to pass it on to their team with, with little advice or follow up. Another finding um, under this finding number two um, was that only 71% of people who responded to the survey said that sharing feedback with leadership was a priority for line managers um, where they work, which seems low to me if we think about how much helpful information line managers could and should have about sentiment and, and whether employees feel aligned with, with the strategy. And finally, in terms of the cross-functional collaboration then, um, four in five respondents said that HR and internal comms do collaborate. So depending on how rose-tinted your glasses are today, uh, you might interpret this as, as I am, which is um, it's a fairly positive indication, I think, that at least providing better communication support to line managers should be possible as, as a team effort, as a cross-functional team effort. Uh, back to you, Chaya, for the third finding. Great, thank you. Um, I was just picking up on the question, uh, sorry, the chat where Fiona, you mentioned sort of that focus on um, line managers. I mean, they're super busy. And that I think in this third finding, it's really touching on the sense of overwhelm that we picked up. This was almost every interview we found. This, they're just it, The message was coming through loud and clear that they're so busy and communicating is just one part of a pretty complex role that they play. Um, when we ask communication professionals how we engage with leaders, we kind of see that there's a bit of a disconnect. Although we want to be able to support line managers, um, many of us are relying on, on email and internet as a way to connect with those line managers. Um, and what was a bit alarming was that 60% of us actually have no plans to change that. Um, they want to be engaged with. Um, and so the way in which we communicate with them the real ask from them was to be more engaging. Um, we're great at slide packs and speaker notes, but that often leads to more of that passive communication. So, I mean, there were real asks in the in the research to make content translatable because they do want to pay that that role as a translator. And, you know, words like they feel like a conductor or a filter or um, or a, a translator and not a channel necessarily. So um, listening to our leaders is really a key point that was an ask from them. Um, and when we listen to them, they can be better listeners themselves. They appreciate being listened to. Um, and when we invite them in to be listened to, um, they feel trusted. So this is a real good signal that those line managers are trusted um, with a message. And when we start to see them as key stakeholders and influencers, um, we we can communicate with them in that in the in a way that sends that message. Um, uh, and kind of anecdote that came out of the research is that line managers are experts in their field, not ours. So 
So I think that's really um, telling about, about how we can maybe put ourselves into the shoes of those line managers. So that was a real kind of whistle stop through um, the key findings. I know that probably brings up lots of things and ideas in your head. Um, we, as, as, as Becky said, we will be staying here in the room. And I mean, I know I see lots of things in the chat. Um, um, however, it'd be really great to pop you into rooms to give you that chance to have a discussion about, first of all, what you've kind of heard in the last few minutes, um, and also what your own um, thoughts are. Within the research um, report, you can see we really wanted to make this practical for you. Um, so we've actually popped in here as I'm browsing quickly through. Okay. Uh, here on page 20, so if you do have it open in a, a PDF, because this will, will not be in your breakout, um, then um, there are six reflection questions. That's to aid you if you kind of get stuck. Um, uh, I'm hoping actually you guys got lots of food for thought. Um, are there any questions before we pop you into rooms? I appreciate it's been a lot of information. Cool. OK, um, so we're going to open up um, the rooms and it will be optional. Um, so if, if it, a box comes up and you feel like staying here in the plenary, um, then you can ignore the box. I believe if that's right. Is that right, Becky? You just have to ignore. I believe so. I mean, the idea is you should have a box up now, I think, um, that says join your room and you'll be put through to a group of about five people. Um, and I, I can see some really specific questions and points in the chat, you know, about measurement, um, training and some quite specific challenges. So for those people, it might be worth you popping into those breakouts and doing a bit of a collective um, brain shower on those points. And then we'll bring everyone back in and we'll come back together after 10 minutes. So click the button if you'd like to join a breakout session and anyone staying, it's to ask some specific questions about the research report. Sorry, uh, people are saying in the chat Wait. that they can't see. Uh, yeah, um, uh, we're just quickly assigning you to a room. Sorry, uh, I'm racing through that as we speak. So hopefully in the next few seconds, uh, you should get that link to join. Apologies. I haven't done breakout rooms in a little while. OK, I see them too. You do? Yeah. Cool. And make sure no one's left in a room on their own. That would be a very lonely way to spend 10 minutes. <laughs> Hi, it's me. It was just me in the room, so I just came back to this one. <laughs> We're That's right. It might be that people haven't quite yet joined. We're rejigging. And we can maybe in the meantime. Oh. Of feedback. Um, in the meantime, does anybody want to kick off with any questions or thoughts that they've got so far? I think listening to our leaders was quite key. I really like that point about listening to our leaders. We don't do that enough, don't we? You know, we, we just don't, you know, we just kind of rely a lot on kind of, you know, what we are being told by employees or colleagues in the survey. We don't often think about, you know, leaders as our audience in that sense you know because we look back at surveys and think what is it that they need and what do we need to equip our leaders based on what other people are telling us but it's not really kind of you know but let's find out you know about the leaders rather than kind of being all a push push comes um so that was quite interesting from my perspective um so listening to the leaders so they can be better listeners themselves yeah well i think and i'll, I'll particularly so between becky and i i I had more focus on the qualitative and Becky on the quantitative, but I'll, maybe you, you've got another reflection as well. But what I think we what we heard in the in the qualitative research was that um, that translates to a feeling of not being trusted, like mm. they don't feel like they're an important stakeholder when they're not being heard. So it's really something that we have to kind of think, well, what would we be telling our leaders to do with an important stakeholder group? And do we do that ourselves? Yeah, another important point there, because, you know, um, I'm in a new role now, six weeks, and I see kind of, you know, how leaders are classed at or line managers, you know, the range of seniority is really, really big, you know, in terms of from, you know, some of the junior line managers to some of kind of, you know, some very senior directors. 
um, which we call grade sevens to nine. So I guess, you know, there is such a variation and what are, the, what are their needs as well, which I'm kind of now beginning to think about, you know, what would be different? So is it a one solution, you know, one kind of pack that probably doesn't work for all of them, given, you know, the range of, um, I guess, seniority and their areas and kind of the teams they look after and their needs as well. More importantly, their needs as leaders and different parts, you know. So, yeah, that's quite, I think, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, but I haven't come to a, a solution necessarily in terms of, you know, do we chunk them up into different groups of leaders and create more work from as a com, you know, from a comms perspective because yeah. not a one size fit all approach yeah exactly yeah mm. hey kevin great to see you hello hi Jana. Oh. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi um everybody what, what i've done on the report i'm really impressed you know um the work you put into is incredible and I love the way you've done the quantitative and the qualitative and you, you know, involved line managers in it because that's really good to get their perspective. So great job. Well done. I just wanted to say um, it's an excellent report. And, you know, there, there are no easy answers here. I mean, <laughs> let me tell you, we've been trying to solve this, <laughs> this line manager communication issue for more than 25 years in my, in my own knowledge and experience. Um, so there aren't any easy answers. I, I think the one thing I would just um, would wanted to kind of raise was the um the point about what we really think the line manager communication role should be be because i think it seems to me if you you, you can ask a number of different internal comms people and, and they'll give you a number of different kind of explanations as to what their role should be um in my own you know my own view is that it should just be focused 80 percent of their time should be just talking about team stuff right because that's what people in their in their groups really want to know about what's going on that week that affects their work in their team and their job. So when we talk about communication from a line manager perspective, that's what employees tell told me they wanted to get from their line manager. Um, but there is this point. This is the this is the difficult point. At an appropriate time, employees want their line manager to make the connections between their teamwork and the contribution to the bigger organization objectives and purpose and all that stuff and that's the that 20 percent is where we come in and how we can support them to do that um and i think that comes down to middle managers because you rightly said i think becky you said about being translators i think that's absolutely right but how how can we help them to translate corporate speak gobbledygook a lot of the time into meaningful stuff for their people so that's why i think we need to be thinking about anyway i shut up great job well done oh no oh, I shut up it's great to hear from you Kevin. and it feels like i'm back on my cipr diploma having feedback about <laughs> that survey which is nice um yeah lots to unpick in that i mean i was um Chai said i was most familiar with the quantitative stuff so I, i'm trying to look at some useful things to pull out there in response to those points um i think to the expectation point in terms of what internal communications people think and expect the role to be, um, what line managers expect the role to be. Um, we know from the survey um, that I think it was, it was pretty high. We're agreeing that comm skills are perceived as part of being a good, a good manager. Um, but when you look in the comments from line managers, there was, I felt anyway, I, I wasn't expecting to see so many of them agree that um, the cascade side of things was in fact part of their role and there was a recognition that it was um so it's your then it's that question you raise is well how do we help them move from cascading they, they know they've got to be sharing organizational messages great a lot of them are accepting that comms people have very high expectations and we're expecting them to be um having excellent communication skills and, and be doing this so how can we bridge the gap if it's not happening um and i think one of the one of the opportunity areas perhaps is that we saw from the survey how collaborative actually internal community a lot of the respondents said their internal comms functions were with HR because the, the way I see it certainly in my current company HR responsible for the upskilling and for the development and comms responsible for the alignment so it, so it feels like if we're able to talk more um it's not even a regularity thing it's just sharing sharing the objective and maybe having a, a, a spotlight shone on it as being that's the priority for a quarter it might get just it might be a nut that we start cracking um 
I came away from the research feeling quite positive about that level of collaboration. I went in quite cynical and I came out feeling quite positive. So we might get there if we start working more closely together. I just pick up on a couple of things that um, that you mentioned, Kevin, as well, that that middle manager absolutely is something that came out in the research. Um, the translatability, made up a word, um, of the content that we provide is so key. Um, something that, that one of the line managers mentions is that you're responsible for the content, I'm responsible for the context. So they know the context of their team and what their team needs to deliver. So then we need to give them the kind of content that allows them to put it into their context. Okay. Elizabeth, I see your hands up too. Hi. Yes, hello. Good morning. I'm a recovering comms professional and now a researcher. And I'm curious, I, I see that one of your um, recommendations is to provide training and support. And I, I, I caught a little bit of that sort of tension between HR and comms. You know, you train them. No, you train them. But the thing I'm interested in is, is if you have any data or, or from your study about do do these line managers and these more senior leaders feel like they're good communicators and they just haven't got time? Or do they feel like they just don't have because it's, it's, you know, this is a pretty big toolbox you need to be able to do to be a good, good communicator. And I'm, I'm curious whether they arrive at the workplace feeling like they know what they're doing and just don't do it, or are they just, they just don't have the actual skills. Um, what I saw was a real mix, actually. Um, and I go back to sort of the thing that, that one of them said is that they're experts in their field, not ours. And so we do have to be mindful of that. But I think we don't make it very easy for them to ask and reach out for help. Like the way in which we, you know, if it's like, and if you can't do this, labeling you as a bad line, bad communicator, um, then you do this extra training that's over there for the people who need some help. Whereas when it's integrated in, um, and um, one person who's particularly keen on, on change communication was talking about how the moment when the change happened and they were provided like later that day with a, a you know a skill capability building for that particular thing straight away and rather than it being like well we send you to the naughty room like I think that is one of the things that that, that kind of came up was there anything in quant quantitative data? yeah it, it was a really good um point and I saw I think it was Sam in the chat saying I I suspect in in my org that line managers think they're really good at communicating um but what we're seeing goes against that I mentioned I went into the research quite cynical that was my expectation but actually from the from the survey the responses from the line managers there was sort of this um an acknowledgement that this was an area that they needed to be developing in but that they needed the support to, to get there so um trying to find where this bit was where I got this bit from but biggest barriers being um not being given enough notice of announcements um uh technology not working um not having bigger organizational pictures so there are things that they were um sharing as barriers to doing their job as as translators that sit with comms or sit with HR um and certainly reflecting on on the work I've done in in comms teams over the last 10 years I can't honestly say we've given those things much attention as working on and doing them better so I think there is an element of of perhaps line managers thinking they are they're good at comms because don't we all we all think we're really good at explaining what we mean um but one point or major takeaway for me was was that actually there's a lot more we can do to remove those barriers for them yeah definitely I've, I've noticed that we've got people back from our breakout rooms um I'd love to hear how your conversations went in those rooms anybody want I to think it, so I just wanted to call back to something we that was said just before we went to breakout, which is line managers are experts in their fields, not ours. And I think this is really, really hits home. I think sometimes you rely on line managers to cascade information in the way that almost as if it's a com silver bullet, like email bulletins might be, a, you know, some people consider it a com silver bullet, where actually you're not, if you're not training them, not supporting them, not assessing it, it's, you know, it, it, it's, its effectiveness is limited so i think that that's really a big a big takeaway 
Yeah, thank you, James. Any other reflections from your conversation? You got a few in the chat as well there, Chaya, oh, yeah. uh, around, uh, Liz mentioned, we covered the challenge around line manager, line management comm standards falling between comms and HR, which I think flows from that conversation just there. And again, it's that collaboration between HR and comms for that shared vision. Yeah, I, and I think there was a piece of data that um, in the research where so line manager kind of felt like if I speak to HR or I speak to comms, it's a very different response. That kind of interconnectivity between the two, um, it felt disjointed for that person. And so where besides the work we do in collaborating and doing the work in, with HR in the background, it has to be a felt sense to line managers that if and when they need help, um, my support functions will pull together and they're and they're coordinated. Um, yeah, I'm just having a look through so, so many comments, but... Um... There was a good question earlier, uh, five minutes ago, about how do we help leaders who say they are too busy to do comms? Love that, to do comms. Uh, my thoughts are, isn't it part of their role as leader to communicate? Um, and so let, let's let's add a uh, slash manager to that so how do we help leaders slash managers who say they're too busy to do comms and coming back to the barriers that the line managers flagged time was the number one thing and you know Chaya said that they're they're really really um under pressure and I think that pressure is real um so when again coming back to I went in very cynical and I came out a little bit more positive I, when I thought I'm hearing you're too busy to do comms everyone has the same amount of time you just have to prioritize things differently so what's really happening is you're deprioritizing comms um but I think there's an element here of what they what is there needs to be more, perhaps a little bit more um pressure and collective understanding that they are that that is the role <laughs> um so actually it's not like it's a bolt-on it's a bolt-on extra um but the research was telling us that in terms of that busy point, um, it's not that is a major factor. It's the number one thing they said, but it's not as simple as that. There are other barriers I mentioned earlier, giving them sort of more notice that is within our control, um, explaining context that's within our control, giving them options to um, drop in and talk to other managers to on the development side, figure out how they're developing their comm skills that's within HR and comms control. Well, I see a few hands up. Um, Adiba, do you want to come off mute? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, hi. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, uh, I think Fiona makes a good point in the uh, comment section about how you can help them. And maybe it's not helping, but to, to help them prioritise it. So if it's part of their PDR, then they've got to do it. And I think if it's not part of their PDR, and it probably isn't, um, or it, it maybe it is maybe that's why they don't think of it as a priority from my experience line managers have been that sort of uh, layer of clay as one of senior director once called them whereas you know uh, nothing permeates up and nothing permeates back down and you do make the research does make a good point it we do need to listen to them and understand the priorities that they have and the challenges they have um, and to help them ha sort of deliver those priorities and challenges. But I do think communications needs to be part and parcel of their line. Man That's their role as a line manager. What's the difference between them and the employee then or the teams that they are looking after if comms or communications or communicating what employees are finding is a challenge or a priority and vice versa, what the organization needs from them. So what, for me, what is the difference then if the, if communications isn't part of their, uh, if they're too busy to communicate? Yeah. Yeah, and what the data told us was that there yeah. isn't enough accountability. Yeah, that accountability yeah. for communicating mm. as part of their leadership role. Mm. Um, just speaking from my own experience i know that i've had many conversations with uh folks where they haven't made the connection that communication has anything to do with leadership no. i do believe these things are so interwoven can you really be a great 
leader if you can't communicate. No, exactly. Um, yeah. And the clay layer often is it sitting above that line manager because who's holding that line manager to account? Yeah. Which is, this is where the line manager, the middle manager came mm. out as a theme to focus on because um, they are the ones telling the line managers whether they're doing a good job or not. So if, a, if their managers never tell them, but you're not communicating very well, or that's a thing that you're being held accountable for, then um, we will, yeah, often come across. Yeah. And I, and, and I just think that good practice, internal comms practitioners are providing them with the, you know, the toolkit, the, the, the channels, the content. So we're trying to aid their role. We're trying to support their role as communicators. What else can we do? You know, if we're, you know, if they want us to listen to them, if they've got feedback, I think it's a poor do excuse to just say, sorry, uh, I'm too busy as a leader. To, to be that communicator, to be that conduit between you and uh, you know the content and the organization. Yeah. Mm. And I think like anything, there will be there will be exceptions who yes, yeah. don't change. And and I wonder if if the, the quick win is finding the people who are saying the barrier is um things that we can control. Because if we're able to shift it's 40% of, of the group who it's genuinely because they just need a bit of a nudge. Um, that's a huge that's a huge improvement and you we, you know in terms of I'm seeing questions about measurement everywhere in terms of how we measure success it's often the comms team or the HR team that's looking at the metric you know the answer to the question you know that all important question at the end of the year I understand my organization's yeah, yeah. Mission bad, right we're the ones who um, have skin in the game to be improving that and so if mm -hmm. we're focusing on on the we, we know from the data that there's an opportunity here um, a lot of them just need more uh, uh, sort of um, more support from the comms and HR function, who I know we're spread pretty thinly, but it's within our gift to do that if this is important. Um, and it's in our interest really to do that because we want those we want those annual report, annual um, survey results to change. I'm just looking at Sarah's hand, which has been in the air for a little while. Sarah, would you like to ask a question or share some ex experience or observations? I, I just wanted to share something, if that's OK, um, um, because I, I when I've worked with uh, line managers um, previously, um, my, my last employer was Shell. Um, it, it's very easy for them to say things like I haven't got time or it's not part of my of my remit. Um, but sometimes when I was talking to people, actually, what what we uncovered was that they just didn't feel they, they had no idea how to start the conversations with their people. They felt very uncomfortable about being vulnerable in front of their teams. They thought that they needed to know everything. And if they didn't know everything, then they didn't feel able to, to talk about it. But one of the things that I saw work really, really well in Shell was when um, there was a, a particular piece of communication that um, line managers needed needed to talk to their staff about um, what Shell would do was, was they would bring um, for that communication cascade would would take place so that as team leaders they could talk with other team leaders about how they were going to approach talking to their staff about it, what the main things around this communication were that they should be focusing on and um, getting them to share ideas about, you know, what, uh, what happens if I, if somebody asks me about this or what, you know, we don't know about this, what should we be saying about that? And it gave them the space and the confidence almost to know that, you know, that, that they were in the same boat as everybody else um, and almost to get a little bit of, of practice and, and, and best practice from people who are more experienced than them. Um, and, and that was definitely one of the things that I saw, I saw work very well at, at Shell. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. I, I recognize that and I know Sarah from Shell, my Shell days too. Um, one of the things that came out in the research was that an, almost an ask of like, give us bite-sized stuff, give us stuff that it makes it easier for us to use it. And yeah, that certainly came out. Um, something that I think we were talking before everybody came back was um, the sense that for line managers, we own the content and they own the context. So they bring the context of the team in which they're in, but we have a con the kind of content that we should ideally be making 
translatable for them? Yeah, it was bite size and from the survey, um, the most effective channel listed was face to face briefings, which clearly high time and high, highly time intensive um, and a lot of effort goes into those. But in terms of effectiveness, that's what we learned were the most effective and the least effective channel was the Internet. I'm so sad to say to all the internal mm -hmm. people out there, but that's not working for line managers. And that was the top of, you know, that was that was what internal comms people were saying they put most of their time into updating. Um, not in the sense that we're, we're doing lots on the internet for line managers, but we're doing very, very little of anything else. Um, so that's worth thinking about. Line managers um, and comms people, when they've measured things, have, have said that face-to-face -face briefings with line managers is what gets um, a step change in how they're communicating. Yeah, and I just read in the, in the qualitative um, support looks like peer support buddies, a forum to help for advice and support as well. Um, things like workshopping more complex content to learn um, and as a, a frame rather than a script. So when there's something complex or has emotional um, triggers, that those things are, are brought up into a place where they have a chance to interact with it. And a couple of interesting thoughts popped in the chat there about snackable content. Um, just conscious we're drawing to a close. We've got two minutes um left does anyone have any other um particularly things to share that they've seen done well or or quick wins that they think um other people could be taking away from the session that you've seen work because i don't know about anyone else i like coming away with a quick win it's not a quick win as such because uh, it requires some effort but um one of the things that really stood out for me is the the lack of training that we give to line managers to make them comfortable um, with having conversations, um, and particularly the, the area that I work in around change. Um, so we are about to embark on some change training for all of our line managers. Communications now has its own module in there to help them through that. Wonderful. That's fantastic. And one of the things that I think they're looking for also is that besides the competence to do it, confidence came up so you know it's confidence and competence together um that kind of feeling that oh they they don't like doing it they don't want to do it well if we really put them ourselves in their shoes if, if you don't feel really confident about it or you really are or then worrying and overthinking it then that takes away the ease of being able to do it so what are we doing to not only give them the skills but actually give them confidence to do so and sometimes confidence to put their hand up and say i'm struggling I need help. Um, so we're just coming to um, the end. I'm just going to use the last minute. Now, Becky and I are able to stay until the bottom of the hour. So if anyone did want to stay on for a little bit of conversation, it is beyond the time we advertise, but we're happy to do that. Um, we just want to point you to um, the, if you wanted to carry on the conversation and you have a Twitter account, you know, please do, um, join conversation on Twitter and you can tag us on is it at we can maybe pop that into the chat but at yeah, yeah, CIPR yeah. inside um the thank you Dan for popping the report in there as well would also just mention that you get five C if you're a CIPR member uh, you get five CPD points for for um for looking at the report itself and reading it and putting your reflections but for joining this session you also get another you can get an additional five points so double point double point yeah so yeah and thank you i mean this has been a really lively session and we're really glad we had a good turnout and that you've been fantastic in getting into conversation um becky any other thanks or final words no, just thanks for all of that. I'm going to be looking through the um, chat after this because I couldn't keep up with all the good ideas and suggestions. So thank you for being so forthcoming with those and for giving up 45 minutes of your day. But as Chai said, we won't disappear, um, but everyone's free to go if, if you need to get out for a walk for a 1.30, etc. But we'll hang about. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.